Okay, welcome to task 2, transport for air worth 26%. What we're going to do today is just sort of introduce you to some of the concepts behind transport economics and what makes uh, a viable transport operation. Okay, I'll just skip ahead of these. And the first note we need to take into account is that transports are derived demand. Nobody gets on an aeroplane for the sake of getting on an aeroplane. What they do is get on an aeroplane for the sake of getting married, or going on a holiday, or getting a facelift perhaps. It's all there to satisfy this greater need. Given that, um, the objective of a transport operator is to minimise the cost of that aircraft. So if we take the example of a taxi, a taxi driver does not know where they will be at any given time because of the nature of the business. They might pick up in Brunswick and drop off in South Yarra or St Kilda. The customer, on the other hand, is mostly unaware of when they will require a taxi, particularly on a Saturday night when they've had a bit too much to drink. Um, so when you add these two together, we get an inefficient supply chain because you either get taxis waiting one behind each other as you've probably seen in the city waiting for customers certain times of the day or vice versa if you're at Flinders Street at one o'clock in the morning on a Saturday which I'm sure you're not because you're all in bed by then then you'll see 300 people waiting for a taxi and none in sight an inefficient supply chain how do we minimize that we do so through forward planning so if everyone in the supply chain is informed of where they're going to be and what they'll need at a particular time, we can have an efficient supply chain. So if the prim primary objective of a transport operator is to maximise capacity utilisation, i.e. the proportion of equipment that is being used in production relative to peak output. So in the case of a taxi, if it has four empty seats, maximum capacity utilisation would be to have four paying bodies in those seats. If you've got three passengers, then you're not maximising the use of that particular mode of transport. But let's uh, have a look at an example uh, in the air industry. We've got our aeroplane there. It's taking off from Sydney. It's going to fly all the way to LA. It's a Boeing 747 with a capacity of 400 people. Peak output. The fuel that you'll need um, to go from Sydney to LA non-stop is 180,000 litres, approximately, because it depends on the atmospherics. If you've got a headwind or you've got to avoid a storm or something, it's going to be a bit more and current price for fuel is 88 cents a litre, that roughly as well, uh, which gives us a total fuel cost of $158,400 to fill up the petrol tanks of our aeroplane. So, just before we take off, we've filled up the tanks, and if we get 400 people arriving, want to wanting to catch our flight we have a 100% capacity utilisation and we can spread the cost of the fuel bill across those 400 people and charging them $396 per person just for the fuel costs. However when the aircraft's going to take off if only 240 passengers arrive and that's 60% of the capacity of that aircraft we've still got the same fuel bill more or less, because obviously it's a bit lighter with less people, uh, but we'll assume it's the same. Then we have to spread that cost over the 240 passengers, and th therefore they're going to have to pay a fair bit more, $660 per person. So in effect, the 240 passengers are actually paying for 400 seats. That's why you think you're on a, on a winner when you get to you know stretch out on a flight because there's no one next to you. The fact is you're actually paying for it anyway. So capacity utilisation is the game. What airlines could do then to make sure we do get our 400 um, p 
people is we might buy an aircraft such as the A380 and we'll change the configuration of the aircraft to suit different markets. So down the bottom here we can have air cargo, this is where our ULDs, unit load devices, go in. So this is appealing to air freight. And as you can see with this picture here, it's very easy. You put it in those boxes or those little containers, ULDs, and then push it in. These are all little rollers there, so it's really easy, very quickly, to fill an aircraft in that manner. On the next level, you've got 10 seats across. Uh, which is kind of what this guy's doing here and we've sort of crammed them in because this is the budget traveller that's prepared to accept a degree of inconvenience for a cheaper flight and just to ensure he doesn't get bored we'll stick a TV in front of him and he's right for the next 20 hours or we can go the other way and attract this sort of passenger that wants a bed on the aircraft and we'll put him obviously up top here in the first on the top tier and as you can see by the number of windows, he, he actually takes up three windows. Whereas this guy the, in the economy would get less than one window per seat. So obviously we're going to have to charge him, perhaps not three times as much, but a significant amount more. And then if you look at this picture, which is from a Thai flight, I think by memory, uh, they've actually offered a little restaurant, so you actually get up off your seat to sit somewhere else and eat in that way and that would appeal for to another type of customer. Problem with that configuration is that when not everyone eats all the time. So there's going to be times when those seats are empty, when the restaurant's empty, and that means once again someone's going to be paying for that. But by having different configurations we can attempt to achieve our overall objective which is when we take off the plane is full. So empty seats on an aircraft or empty space in a container or an idle sewing machine is less than 100% efficient it's not achieving maximum capacity utilization which is our objective